Um, so Dr. Fauci, uh, you're preparing to step away from uh, NIH, and I'm just wondering how you're sort of feeling in these final weeks. Well, it's a bittersweet feeling because I have been at the National Institutes of Health for now 54 years, and I have been the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases for the last 38 years. So I, I feel good about and enthusiastic about what I would consider the next phase in a very long career, uh, but it is very uh, poignant and and, and emotional uh, to realize that 54 years ago, I came to this institution, this campus here in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, driving down from New York City as a newly minted physician who had just finished his residency training in a New York City hospital to come down for an infectious diseases fellowship really not knowing what was ahead, uh, really being, in many respects, pluripotential, not knowing what direction I was going to go. And I've really had the, the privilege of having had the opportunity to get involved in some things that I feel very good about over the course of my career. But I do feel an enthusiasm about asking myself, which I have done at my age, since I've been here for 54 years, I came as a 27-year-old newly minted physician, and I'm now a soon-to-be 82-year-old senior person in the biomedical research and, and global health establishment. So I ask myself, what do I have to offer the country and the world? because I've been in public service my entire professional life and I want to stay in public service, even though I'm not gonna be in the, in the auspices and under the umbrella of the federal government. And I think one of the things I wanna do is I wanna be able to, to use the benefit of my multi-multi-decade experience to perhaps help others in an advisory capacity to write, to lecture, and to maybe and hopefully inspire younger people who are in science or those who are considering going into science and public health, what a wonderful field that is, particularly if it's done in the arena of public service. Yeah, I have to ask, as you look back on all those decades uh, in public service, is there a, a favorite moment, a favorite memory, a favorite accomplishment that really stands out to you? You know, I'd have to say there isn't a favorite because I have had the privilege of, of, of over such an extended period of time of wearing multiple hats, the hat of a scientist prior to HIV, the hat of a scientist with the emergence of HIV, the hat of an institute director of a very, very large uh, biomedical research institution here at the NIH, and as the hat of someone who's gotten involved in policy where I've had the privilege of advising seven presidents of the United States, starting with Ronald Reagan. And in each of those buckets of my life, as it were, there is one or two things that I feel pretty good about. I mean, prior to HIV, I was involved in a very niche kind of area of biomedical research and looking for therapies for formerly fatal inflammatory diseases that are unusual, if not rare, not very many people heard about it, but they were deadly diseases. And I had the opportunity to develop therapies that had a 95% remission in other wise fatal diseases. So I felt very good about that element of research, even though it was very well confined and not very many people were aware of it, which is fine. That's not the reason to do it. Um, then when HIV came along, I have for the last 40 plus years had that be my focus of my own personal research. And I've had the opportunity to delineate what we call some of the pathogenic mechanisms of HIV disease. And by no means that I do that alone. There were so many good people throughout the country and the world who've contributed to that. But it is recognized that I've played an important role in that. So I feel good about that. Then the next hat 
was as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And the thing that I feel good about that, a high point, is that I established a separate division to focus predominantly on HIV AIDS at a time when the world did not have much of interest in HIV AIDS, even though it was insidiously creeping through the world, killing a lot of people. And the, and the group that I put together, the Division of AIDS, by granting and contracting with a lot of talented investigators throughout the country and the world, and partnering with the pharmaceutical companies, we were able to be part of the process that put together the combinations of drugs that have literally saved millions of lives throughout the world and really converted HIV disease from an otherwise fatal disease to a chronic condition that people could live essentially normal lives. And then the other one was my opportunity to interact with seven presidents of the United States. And one stands out in particular when President George W. Bush gave me the opportunity because of his vision to try and make sure that people who live in areas of the world that don't have resources, that have a lot of HIV, that they won't die because of lack of ability to get proper drugs and treatment and, and prevention. So he tasked me, and I very gladly accepted the task, of being one of the principal architects of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, which has actually resulted in the saving of anywhere from 18 to 20 million lives worldwide. That's probably the thing that I feel most uh, good about in the sense of having had the privilege of being able to be part of that. And then the last three years you know very well about is that we've had the opportunity of being part of our response to COVID-19, particularly my responsibility was the scientific part of it, which was a great success because again, in collaboration with pharmaceutical companies and utilizing, utilizing the talents and the vision of a lot of good scientists throughout the country and the world to put together a vaccine in an absolutely unprecedented record time of 11 months from the time that the virus was recognized in January of 2020 to the time that 11 months later, we had a vaccine that was safe and highly effective in essentially saving millions of lives. So when you have a career as long as I have, there were multiple components of that, each of which has a little bit of a twist to us. And I just feel that I've been extremely fortunate to have had the opportunity to participate in some of the things that we've just discussed. Yeah, you know, I wanted to ask you uh, as well, because, you know, you've been in the public eye through all of this, right? You've been in the public eye through your work with HIV, right, through to your work with COVID. And I'm sort of curious what you've seen in the changes in public discourse and the challenges around communicating issues of public health uh, to, to everyday people. Well, there are a number of challenges, but the one that is the most uh, pressing right now, and in many respects, the most disturbing is the anti-science attitude uh, among some, which is associated, for example, specifically with an anti-vax movement when we know that vaccines are life-saving and safe, but importantly, the politicization of science, where in the United States, you have the adherence or not to very clear public health principles that are influenced strongly by one's ideology, where you should have a uniform approach towards an acceptance of things that are proven to be life-saving. And yet you have the uptake of vaccines and the performance of, of uh, uh, activities that are aimed at preventing the spread and the effect of infection and you have major differences in the country based on ideology. An example of that is if you look at red states 
versus blue states or Republican conservative dominated states versus moderate or more progressive uh, states that are blue states, you find that the degree of uptake of vaccine is much, much less among the red states. And that results, quite frankly, and the data are clear, in more hospitalizations and deaths in those areas of the country. That should never be. A person should not suffer and die because certain ideologies tell them that they should or should not accept the vaccine. It doesn't matter what your political ideology is. When you have a life-saving intervention, you should utilize that life-saving intervention, not only for yourself, but for your family and your community. Does that make you worry about what the response to the next public health emergency or next pandemic could look like? Well, if we have the degree of political divisiveness in our country with the next pandemic, I'm afraid that the response in many respects could even be worse uh, in some areas than it was. We had a very good scientific preparedness and response, but not such a very good public health response, even though we thought we were really very well prepared. My hope is that we learn the lessons of the things that we could have done better during this outbreak. And I hope one of the lessons is the obvious nature and the obvious uh, realization that political divisiveness is not helpful when you're dealing with a common enemy, that's the virus. And when we learn that the enemy is the virus, not each other, then let's get together, all of us, and work as, as, as one unified approach towards essentially combating a thing that's killing us, no matter whether we are of one political ideology or another. I know that uh, you and your family have, have sort of paid a terrible price for the, the amount of polarization around the COVID response. Uh, would you have ever expected that as a scientist that you would have been sort of the, the central public figure and face of the polarization around a, a, a public health emergency? No, the answer was no. Obviously not in my wildest dreams would I have thought that an issue that, that I chose as my profession which is saving the lives and protecting people against illness, which is what I've done ever since I entered medical school, um, that that would be a reason for people to have uh, extraordinary hostility towards people in my field with the personification because I'm a very visible person that I have become, you know, the boogeyman, as it were, of the radical elements in our society, which is really quite unfortunate. Do you worry that that's going to follow you to whatever you do next? Well, I worry less about it following me to whatever I do next and the impact that that will have on the younger generation of scientists when they see, when they're trying to do their job, that they're being harassed and threatened. And uh, I'm not the only person. Uh, I'm a, a person who's visible, but there are many, many hardworking physicians, public health officials at the local level in cities and states throughout the country who are being harassed because of things that they're saying that are merely the articulation of public health principles. That just doesn't make any sense at all that a public health official in a city or a state somewhere in the United States is getting harassed and even threatened because they're doing things that are trying to save the lives of their fellow citizens. After all these decades uh, in public service, what's the one thing that keeps you up at night and what's the one thing that gives you the most hope for the future? Well, what gives me the most hope is 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 the field that I'm in because science has has been so extraordinary in providing us with the tools to uh, get interventions such as vaccines. And the, such the classic historic example is what has happened with COVID, where you have a vaccine that has literally saved millions and millions of lives throughout the world. 
And we've gotten there because we've made an investment in science. So that's the thing that I feel good about, that we need to continue the support of science. The thing that keeps me up at night is the thing that has always kept me up at night. Unfortunately, that nightmare we're living through right now is the fact that we might have yet again another pandemic and we will not be prepared for it if we don't learn the lessons of what we've been through right now. And as a final question, any advice for who comes next after you at NIH? Yeah, I mean, my advice would be to stick with the science and follow the science and try as best as you can to articulate what these scientific principles are as, as, as best as you possibly can so that people could understand that. And by all means, stay out of politics. I mean, uh, I've, I've uh, been as apolitical as anybody could possibly be. I have served seven presidents, some of whom have been ideologically extremely different from another one. And yet we've had the opportunity to be able to advise them by sticking to the science, sticking to the truth, and staying out of any ideology or any political persuasion. Wonderful, uh, that's great for me. Thank you for your time, sir, I really appreciate it. My pleasure, good to be with you. Thank you for having me.